Hi everyone! Welcome to Pamantasan ng Nusod ng Pasi College of Nursing and of course to your course NUR 101 Anatomy and Physiology. I would like to introduce to you your first module, which is the human organism. This module introduces and emphasizes the important relationship between structure and function, integrating the six levels of organization and their characteristics. The body plan and basic anatomical terminology are presented with directional terms, planes of section, and general body regions. The major trunk cavities and serous membranes associated with each are presented. The concept of homeostasis is described and negative feedback mechanisms are stressed as a normal means for maintaining homeostasis, the relationship between structure and function, and the concepts of homeostasis can be powerful organizing themes for an entire course. Let us define the terminology anatomy. When we say anatomy, it is a scientific discipline that investigates the body's structure. For example, the shape and size of bones. In addition, anatomy examines the relationship between the structure of a body part and its function. Thus, the fact that the bone cells are surrounded by a hard, mineralized substance enables the bones to provide strength and support. Understanding the relationship between structure and function makes it easier to understand and appreciate anatomy. There are two basic approaches to the study of anatomy. They are systemic anatomy and regional anatomy. When we say systemic anatomy, it is the study of the body system, such as, for example, cardiovascular, nervous, skeletal, and muscular systems. This is the approach taken in this usually most introductory textbooks. Meanwhile, regional anatomy is the study of the organization of the body by areas within each region, such as the head, abdomen, or arm. All systems are studied simultaneously, and this approach is usually taken by most medical schools and dental schools. Those who are interested in the study of body structures have two general ways to examine the internal structures of a living person, and these are surface anatomy and anatomical imaging. When we do say surface anatomy, it is the study of external features such as body pro bony projections, which serve as landmarks for locating deeper structures. Meanwhile, anatomical imaging involves the use of X-rays, ultrasound, and magnetic resonance imaging for MRI, and other technologies to create pictures of internal structures such as when determining if a bone is broken or a ligament is torn. Both surface anatomy and anatomical imaging provide important information for diagnosing diseases. Meanwhile, let us define what is physiology. Physiology is known to be the scientific discipline that deals with the processes or functions of living things. It is important in physiology to recognize structures such as dynamic, rather than fixed and unchanging. The major goals for studying physiology are first, to understand and predict the body's responses to stimuli, and secondly, to understand how the body maintains internal conditions within a narrow range of values in the presence of continually changing internal and external environments. Human physiology is the study of scientific organisms, the human, where cellular physiology and systemic physiology are subdivisions that emphasizes a specific organizational level, which are cells for the cellular physiology, and studies the body organ systems for the systemic physiology. The body can be studied at six structural levels chemical, cell, tissue, organ, organ system, and organism. 
the first level of structural organism is the chemical level. The structural and functional characteristics of all organisms are determined by their chemical makeup. The chemical level of organization involves how atoms such as hydrogen and carbon interact and combine into molecules. This is important because of molecules structure determines its function. For example, collagen molecules are strong, rope-like fibers that gives skin structural strength and flexibility. Due to old age, the structure of collagen changes and the skin becomes fragile and saggy and usually easily torn during everyday activities. Second level of organization is cellular. Cells are the basic structural and functional units of each organism, such as plants, animals, and human. Molecules can combine to form organelles, which are small structures that make up some cells. For example, the nucleus contains the cells hereditary, information, and the mitochondria manufactures adenosine triphosphate, a molecule cells use for source of energy. Although cell types differ in their structure, they have many characteristics in common. The knowledge of these characteristics and their variations is essential to a basic understanding of their anatomy and physiology. As the cells combine together, they make up tissues. Tissues are a group of cells with similar structures and function, plus extracellular substances that they release. And there are four broad types of these tissues. First is epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissues. An organ is composed of two or more tissue types that together perform one or more common functions. As tissues come together, they do form organs, examples of which are your stomach, liver, heart, ovary, bladder, and kidneys. As organs come together, they are considered to be an organ system. An organ system is a group of organs classified as a unit because of a common function or set of functions. For example, in this one. The kidneys produce urine, which is transported by the ureters going to the urinary bladder, where it is stored until eliminated by the body by passing through your urethra. The coordinated activity of the organ system is necessary for normal function. Another example is a digestive system, which takes in food, processing it into nutrients that are carried by the blood of the cardiovascular system to the cells of other systems. These cells use the nutrients and produce waste products that are carried by the blood to the kidneys of the urinary system, which now then remove the waste products from the blood. Because the organ systems are so interrelated, this function in one organ system can, can have profound effects on other systems. For example, a heart attack can result in inadequate circulation of blood. Consequently, the organs of other systems, such as the brain and kidneys, can now malfunction. And lastly, the last level of structural and functional organization is your organism level. An organism is any living thing considered as a whole, whether composed of one cell, such as bacterium, or of trillions of cells, such as human. Human organism is a complex of organ systems that are working together and which are dependent upon one another. Let us now have a review of your structural and functional level organization. Remember that there are six levels of organization, the chemical level, cellular level, tissue level, organ level, organ system level, and the organism level. Look at these blue balls. These are considered to be your atom. As they combine, they form molecules. These molecules form organelles such as the nucleus and the mitochondria, 
which make up cells. When these same cells come together, they form tissue, which may surround some several organs. An organ level is when different tissues come together to form organs, such as the urinary bladder in this, in this example. The organ level now involves different organs that are working together in this case to eliminate body waste from the body, such as the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. As different organs system works, they now form the organism. An organ system makes up an organism such as different reproductive system, respiratory system, and cardiovascular system. <clears throat> There are different major organs of the body, and this includes the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the large and the small intestines, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. There are many different organ systems in our body. These are the ones that we will be discussing through the course of your anatomy and physiology. There are 12 organ systems of the body. First would be the integumentary system. The integumentary system's primary purpose is for protection, but it also involves in regulation of the temperature, prevention of water loss, and production of vitamin D. Organs included in this system are the skin, hair, nails, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. The second one would be the skeletal system. It provides protection and support, allows body movements, produces blood cells, and stores minerals and adipose tissues. This includes bone, cartilages, ligaments, and joints. Another system that works with the skeletal system for body movements is your muscular system. Other than that, it maintains the posture and helps in the production of body heat. Fourth would be the nervous system. It is a major regulatory system that detects sensations and controls movement, physiological responses, and of course, intellectual actions. It is consisted of the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, and sensory receptors. Another system is your endocrine system which is a major regulatory system that influences metabolism, growth, reproduction, and many other functions. Sixth would be the cardiovascular system that transports nutrients, waste products, gases, and hormones throughout the body. It is consisted of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. Another would be your lymphatic system. This removes foreign substances from the blood and the lymph, which combats diseases, maintains tissue fluid balance, and absorbs dietary fats. It is consisted of lymphatic vessels, which are usually found on your axillary, the groin, and the neck are your lymph nodes and other lymphatic organs. Next is your respiratory system. This exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and air and regulates the blood pH. It is consisted of your lungs and the respiratory passages. Meanwhile, the digestive system performs mechanical and chemical processes of digestion, which includes absorption of nutrients and elimination of wastes. This, this starts from your mouth going to your esophagus it ends at your anus. The urinary system removes waste products from the blood and regulates blood pH, ion balance, and water balance. This consisted of kidneys, urinary bladder, and ureters. The reproductive system is composed of a male and a female reproductive system. The female reproductive system produces oocytes and it is the site of fertilization and fetal development, while the male reproductive system produces transfer of cells, sperm cells to the female and produces hormones that influence sexual functions and behavior.
Humans are organisms sharing characteristics with another organisms. The most important common features of all organisms is life. We are to discuss now the six characteristics of life. These are your organization, metabolism, responsiveness, growth, development, and reproduction. When we do say organization, this refers to the functional interrelationship between organs. Living things are highly organized. All organisms are composed of one or more cells. Some cells, in turn, are composed of highly special, specialized organelles, which depend on the precise function of large molecules. Secondly, the metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical and physical changes sustaining an organism. For example, plants capture energy from the sunlight to synthesize sugar, as we all know it as photosynthesis, and humans obtain their energy from the food that they take. Metabolism is the ability to acquire and use energy in support of these changes. Third would be responsiveness. It is the ability of an organism to sense changes in the environment and make adjustments that help maintain life. Examples of responses are movements toward food or water and away from danger or for poor environmental conditions such as extreme cold. Imagine that an individual does not have a responsiveness characteristic. So it could lead to death of that individual. For example, if body temperature increases in a hot environment, as a response, sweat glands will produce, of course, sweat, which can lower the body temperature down to the normal level and therefore could maintain life. The fourth characteristic of life is glowing. This refers to an increase in the size of all or part of the organism. It can result from an increase in cell number, cell size, and the amount of substance surrounding the cells. For example, bones grow when the number of bone cells increases and the bone cells become surrounded by bone matrix. Next will be development. Development includes changes in non organism. This may be in the form and the size. Human development begins when the egg is fertilized with a sperm and ends with death. The greatest developmental changes occurs before birth, but many changes continue after birth and some continue throughout the life. Changes in cell structure and function from general, generalized to specialized is considered to be differentiation. For example, the following fertilization, cells start to specialize to become different cell types, such as the skin, bone, muscle, nerve cells. These differentiated cells form tissues on organs. And lastly, would be reproduction. It is the formation of new cells or new organisms without reproduction. Growth and tissue repair are impossible. Without reproduction of organisms, the species become extinct. This reproduction may involve, for example, in the skin is tissue repair. We are continually changing our skin every day in the form of your uh, epithelial cells. We have learned already the organizational level of the body and of course the different organ systems. At this point, we are to describe what is homeostasis and explain why is it important for the proper body function. Homeostasis is considered to be the existence and maintenance of a relatively constant environment within the body despite fluctuation in either the external or the internal environment. Most body cells are surrounded by a small fluid and normal cell functions depend on the maintenance of the cell's fluid environment within the chemical content. Variables are considered to be measures of the body properties that may change and vary. For example, the body temperature. The normal body temperature is considered to be 36.5 to 37.5 degrees centigrade. Anything that is above the 37.5 is considered 
hyperthermia or an increase in the body temperature. And below would be hyperthermia, which is a body temperature less than the normal. Any above and below of this normal ranges or variables are considered to be abnormal. Another would be heart rate. The heart rate's normal value or variable would be 60 beats per minute to 100 beats per minute for adults. Blood pressure, blood glucose levels, blood cell counts, and the respiratory rates are other examples of variables. Homeostatic mechanisms such as sweating or shivering normally maintain body temperature near an average normal value or set point. Most homeostatic mechanisms are governed by the nervous system or the endocrine system. Take note that homeostatic mechanisms are not able to maintain body temperature precisely at the set point. Instead, the body temperature increases or decreases slightly around the set point, producing a normal range of value. As long as the body temperatures remain within normal, or within this range, homeostasis is considered to be maintained. Remember as well that set points are considered to be the average of the normal range. For example, your body temperature with a normal range of 36.5 to 37.5 would have a set point of 37 degrees centigrade. Set points for some variables can be temporarily adjusted depending on body activities as needed. For example, the body temperature. Body temperature may change due to fever and set points could also change. Another example would be your heart rate, blood pressure, and the respiratory rate which may be triggered or changed due to the activity exercise. There are two feedback mechanisms under homeostasis, negative feedback and positive feedback. Most systems of the body are regulated by negative feedback mechanisms, which maintain homeostasis. In everyday term, we usually use negative to mean bad or undesirable. However, in this context, negative may mean is to decrease. Negative feedback mechanism is any deviation from the set point is made smaller or is resisted. Negative feedback does not prevent variation but maintains variation within the normal range. When we are talking about negative feedback, there could be two responses involved. It could be your detection and correction. When we do say detection, it is of the deviation is away from the set point. Meaning, for example, the temperature of 36.5 to 37.5. The deviation is that when the body temperature is more than those ranges. And correction is when the reversal of the deviation towards the set point for going back to the normal range. The maintenance of normal body temperature is an example of a negative feedback mechanism. Normal body temperature is important because it allows molecules and enzymes to keep their normal shape so they can function optimally. An optimal body temperature prevents molecules from being permanently, permanently destroyed. Look at this image in front. So the vertical axis represents the levels of the body temperature. Please be noted that the normal body temperature is 36.5 to 37.5. The set point or our average would be 37 degree centigrade. This represents now the 37 degree centigrade. An increase in the body temperature as we call also as hyperthermia or pyrexia, causes the imbalance of the homeostasis. So when the body detects the changes or deviation, it will counteract leading to sweating so that the body may decrease now the body temperature. As an effect, the body will now maintain the body temperature at its normal range of levels. Most negative feedback mechanisms, such as that one in the body temperature, have three components. First is the receptor. It monitors the value of the variable, such as the body temperature, by identifying or detecting its stimuli. Second one would be a control center, such as the part of the brain 
that may control or determine the set point for the variable and receives input from the receptor about the variable. So it also sends signal to the effector. When we do now say effector, it is that directly causes change in the variable. For example, a sweat gland can change the value of the variable when detected by the control center. Look at now this figure 1.5. Let us talk about or place as an example the body temperature that we are discussing earlier. The control center of your body temperature is the brain. So a factor and stimuli factor or the receptors are placed onto the skin. So when, for example, an individual is exposed to the very warm temperature, for example, during a flag ceremony in the playground or in the grounds of the school, so the sun is directly pointed onto the skin of the patient. So the receptor now will send signal to the brain that the body may be turning or having an increased body temperature. So the body or the brain would want to maintain the normal range of 36.5 to 37.5. So now the hypothalamus of the brain, which is the control center for the body temperature, will now send signal to your effectors or your sweat glands. The sweat glands could be the effector of the body temperature. It will now causing dilation of the blood vessels or as we call as vasodilation. So vasodilation happens, so it will now increase the release of sweat glands or the release of sweat from those sweat glands, therefore decreasing the body temperature of the patient. All right, so we are now to discuss the second feedback mechanisms under homeostasis, which is positive feedback. Positive feedback mechanisms occur when the initial stimulus further stimulates the response. In other words, when we do say positive, it means that the deviation from the set point becomes even greater. Remember that when we do say negative feedback, it means to decrease or to stop the production of specific enzyme or activity of the body. However, in this case, when we do say positive, it indicates an increase, could be an, in a release of enzymes or in, a, in the body's activities. At times for this type of response is required to re-achieve homeostasis. It is considered that negative feedback mechanism is the normal or the expected feedback mechanism. On the other hand, positive feedback are usually the deviation or what we do see in those patients with injuries or diseases. So a system of response causes progressive deviation away from the set point and outside the normal range. And it is not directly used for homeostasis. So for example, it's during childbirth or any other injuries and diseases when blood flow are usually continuously uh, flowing. So the body cannot identify any problem with that. So it will continuously flowing, flowing until the patient uh, bleeds out and loses blood and may lead to death. We now have learned the two mechanisms under the homeostasis and at this point we are to compare the two. Remember that negative feedback is considered to be the expected or the desired feedback mechanism which maintains homeostasis while on the other hand positive feedback mechanism are those of undesired and usually seen in those patients with injuries or diseases. So in this illustration, the illustration A, so let's take for example during blood clotting, the active product which represents thrombin which triggers enzyme A as a first step in the cascade that leads to the production of thrombin. So it, is, it may be considered as a cycle. So A is needed for the activation of enzyme B. Let's see it as like that. So when we have negative feedback, there could be a decrease or absent in the supply of enzyme B for production of enzyme A. On the other hand, the positive feedback, there could be a continuous production or supply of enzyme B or the active product from B to the other end product 
which is the enzyme A. So remember, for negative feedback, there could be a decrease or absence of the supply. And for the positive feedback, there could be a continuous supply. So another example, let's look onto the analogy. For example, you have a pitcher or a pail of water. When you collect water from the faucet, diba? you open the faucet, then water will continuously flow from it until the pail is full. So when the pail is already full with water or filled with water, you as the person waiting for it, you will turn off now the faucet. So because you detected that the pail is full already with water and that is negative feedback. And it is expected from you to turn off the faucet when the pail is full of water. However, when we do say positive feedback, so let's take it as it is again. So the pail is already nearly full with water coming out from the faucet. You as an individual still stands there and do nothing even if the water is already flowing out of the pail. So that is positive feedback. You do not stop the supply of, on that case, water onto the pail and causing no problem.